Thank you so much, Brenna. And um, I'm a, a member of the Environmental Commission and we're so excited for this partnership with the library. Uh, thank you for um, just creating these opportunities for us to educate residents and um, encourage uh, healthy behaviors um, that'll improve and make a difference for generations. So I wanted to say, um, I had this past spring, there was a, um, a symposium uh, also sponsored by Renee Frigo here in Glen Ellen. And I learned from the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Region Tree Initiative that there's been some great news over the last 10 years that our um, tree coverage, our canopy has actually grown over those 10 years, which is terrific news. Uh, but the bad news was it was mostly through invasive species or, or a majority of that growth was through that. And so there is a region-wide initiative to eliminate some of those invasive species and be able to um, replace them with native alternatives. So I was excited about this um, talk that the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Region Trees Initiative has put together to give us some really um, actionable uh, ac um, recommendations, um, but also just some of, some additional data um, that can spur us on to take some of these actions as well. So I wanted to um, thank both Melissa Kustick, who's Operations Manager for Chicago Region's Tree Initiative for joining us, and is a great partnership with the Martin, Morton Arboretum, um, which is another one of our neighbors, and also Renee Frigo from the Park District, who is also a terrific ongoing sponsor. So I wanted to see if Renee um, could share a little bit from her experience. She um, is a caretaker for many, many of the Glen Ellen parks and sees firsthand <clears throat> the differences between invasive species and native shrubs and the impact they have over time. Uh, so Renee, could you kind of give us a little bit of a baseline about why this is so important? Absolutely. Um, again, I want to just mirror Christy's thank you to both um, Melissa and Brenna, uh, the library and the Chicago Region Trees Initiative for for. Um, doing this this evening. So I, I don't want to talk a lot, but I do want to say that I have spent probably the last 20 plus years battling buckthorn, and you're going to hear about that tonight. Um, it is an evil thing. I joke saying it's my job security because I don't think we'll ever get rid of it. Um, I nicknamed my chainsaw at work Buckthorn Betty because she and I spend a whole lot of time cutting it down. Um, but when we cut it down, there's like this blank slate of great things um, that we can do to try to restore our, our habitats. And that includes your backyard. Um, buckthorn and honeysuckle and some other invasive trees um, provide some services that a lot of times residents don't want to part with or get rid of. So this talk tonight will be um, addressing some of those things and what, while you may have to remove some things, there's some better things to put in there that, that work wonderful. And I see it firsthand um, when we restore areas and take the invasive things out and put the better things in, the insects come back. When the insects come back, the birds come back. When the birds come back, you start seeing um, just different things. And so there's this trickle down effect just by replacing the bad plants, so to speak, with new ones. So anyway, I highly encourage you to take some action and you'll learn some ways to do that tonight. And again, um, you know, we're just so happy to, to be educating people on this topic. So Melissa, thank you very much. And I'll let you um, share all of your knowledge with everybody now. Thank you. All right. So for a moment there, I couldn't get my unmute button back. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Melissa Kustik. As she mentioned, I'm with the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. Um, can't really give this talk without starting and saying what I mean when I say the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. And I know that you all got to um, learn from Lydia Scott in June. Um, and she probably shared this information, but you know, you've got to hear something seven times before you can remember it. So um, let me just repeat some things a few times. So the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is a coalition of more than 200 organizations that includes park districts, municipalities, government agencies, commercial groups, nonprofits, uh, land trusts, community groups. It's a whole lot of organizations and people working together to ensure that the trees in the seven county region are healthier, more abundant, more diverse, and more equitably distributed and really you know, we're a bunch of tree huggers, but it's not for the trees. We're doing it for the people who live here because 
having trees around you improves your quality of life in many, many ways. Anyway, tonight I'm really gonna focus on um, hopefully convincing you that you, uh, the land, your yard has value. Um, then I'll cover why and how to remove invasives and even some identifiers. So if you're not sure if what you have is buckthorn, you should be sure by the end of this. Um, suggest a few replacements for those in terms of trees and shrubs. And then of course, the make it last at the end, because if you're gonna plant a tree, I wanna make sure you know how to take care of it so that it becomes a really big, beautiful, mature tree and provides lots of benefits. All right, so the value of your land. The motto of the Chicago Region Trees Initiative is science to action. So when we decided as several organizations to start this initiative, we collected a lot of data and we want to know if we're actually having an impact. And so we continue to collect a lot of data and it tracks any changes. So we can see, are we having a positive impact? Are things changing in a bad direction? What do we need to know and how can we act on it in a way that is backed by science? So I have a list here of several of the types of data that we collect, data sets that we are managing. Um, and I'm gonna just touch on some of these that are relevant to tonight's topic here. So first one of them is our, what we call tree canopy cover. Um, and this we're able to collect because every county flies airplanes back and forth across their county every couple of years. Um, and those airplanes shoot down lasers, the lasers bounce back up and the rate at which they come back gives us an idea of what is on the ground. And it makes these really neat two-dimensional maps, which you see on this side. So this is the satellite version. This is the two-dimensional map that comes with lighter information. And you can see it's really just processing. If you're a bird flying overhead, looking down, what is covering the ground in every, every square foot? So you can see here the bare dirt is what's brown. Um, over here where it's grass and low-lying vegetation that comes up as a lighter yellow, sorry, lighter, lighter green. Um, that's any kind of low-level um, vegetation. So it could be crops, it could be grass, it could be some flower beds, so just the shorter stuff. You can see these big squarish red things are buildings and these big fluffy green things are trees. So because of this LIDAR data, we actually know where the trees are in our region and on a pretty, um, granular scale. So we know where their trees are and where the trees are not. Here is um, a gridded version of what that looks like over the seven counties. Where it's dark blue, there's lots of trees. Where it's light yellow, there are very few trees. So first, you'll notice a few trends. The further you get from the city, the more you see these big patches of low canopy cover. Um, <laughs> I think, I go ahead and throw in the chat why you think that is. Um, and I would guess anybody who is typing in right now, you're gonna say agriculture, because yes, as you get further away from the cities and the suburbs in the Southern County region, there is more agriculture. And we are not encouraging people to replace soy fields and corn fields with trees, but maybe adding trees along riparian cordons or to form windbreaks or where they make strategic sense to put in trees there. But also you can look that some of the urban areas also have low canopy cover. And those are often a result of industry or um, low investment over the last few decades. So those are the places where we're really focusing a lot of our action. The other thing we learned, um, and this is from 2010, so Lydia probably mentioned this also, we found out 70% of the trees in this region are on private property. So your backyards matter a lot because if all we do is work with park districts and municipalities and focus on public trees, we're only addressing 30% of the trees that are out in the region. We also have this fantastic data set about oak ecosystems. So oaks are a heritage species. In fact, next month is October Oak Awareness Month. So if this is the first you're hearing of it, I encourage you to look it up, find some events near you and celebrate next month. You know, go on a guided hike, go do some stewardship work, um, help Renee cut some of that buckthorn down. <coughs> so oak ecosystems are part of the heritage of this region. It was our predominant wooded ecosystem. Um, so where you see the green, <coughs> excuse me, is where we had oak ecosystems in the 1830s. We know this because that was when the federal government was funding surveys across the region so that they could find out what existed in different places. Fast forward to 2010, this is what was left of those oak ecosystems. 
we're down to the last 17% of what our heritage was prior to European settlement. So I'm just gonna show those maps again. That's where it was. That's what we had as of 2010. So why does that matter? Well, besides losing, you know, the oaks and the heritage that comes with it, the meaning, the trees that have witnessed so much history, um, those oak ecosystems are also supporting so much wildlife. It provides food and habitat for all kinds of species. In fact, Doug Talame did a study looking at um, the Lepidoptera species, so the, uh, the moths and butterflies, and found that oaks support 534 different species of moths and butterflies. Not only are those pollinators, but those are also food for birds. It's really important that we have oaks around because it's supporting all kinds of wildlife based on this food source that expands out. And if you're interested to see how oak ecosystems um, are related to where you are specifically, look, uh, you can go to this interactive map on our website, chicagorti.org slash oak map. It's an interactive map, but it's a little bit tricky to understand. So I'm gonna explain a little bit. The different colors on here, blue is core areas. So where we still have larger areas of oak ecosystems that are remnants that are still intact. Um, green are the ones that are maybe smaller or maybe just separated from everything else. And then purple, I'll zoom in. Oh, wrong way. You can see these purple lines are the proposed corridors for connecting these remnant core areas, these blue areas. Um, and the idea is really because so much wildlife depends on these core areas, these blue remnants, if we could connect them, create wildlife corridors, the birds, the herps, all kinds of animals could then use those corridors. So perhaps this, this purple line runs through a municipality or runs through a residential section. Well, if those residents planted oaks and hickories and other companion species in their yards, it would create that corridor between the two cores. So that's what we're trying to encourage with this map. And here it is zoomed in even more. You can see the goal with these corridors is to connect all of these areas. And by the way, we used ArcGIS to come up with the pathways that made the most sense, but then we ran it by many land managers in the seven county region so that they could weigh in. You know, maybe it doesn't actually make sense here. Maybe traditionally it was here. Um, so it's, it's got some good basis for how we created those corridors. <laughs> All right, so your yard is important, um, but why do we care about the invasives? Can't you just plant an oak and be done? You cannot. What is an invasive species? Well, I really like this US Forest Service definition because it kind of covers all the aspects. One, it's non-native to the ecosystem under consideration. So yes, there are aggressive native plants, but those are not invasive. Um, they just need to be surrounded by the right plants to keep them in check, or they need to be in the right area to keep them in check. So it has to be non-native. And the introduction of this organism, in this case, I'm talking about the introduction of this plant, causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So there's a lot of ways plants can be destructive. Um, and without question, buckthorn and honeysuckle and several others that I'll briefly touch on tonight fall into that category. So I mentioned buckthorn. Um, if you've ever tried to remove buckthorn, you already know what a pain in the butt it is. Um, but the reason that you've probably been hearing about it so much lately is that, um, as you heard at the beginning of this presentation, the numbers have gone up quite a bit. So whereas 10 years ago, our surveys found that buckler made up about 28% of all the trees in the region, it now makes up 36% of all the trees in the Chicago region. That is a big, uh, a, that is a lot of growth. That is a lot more buckthorn. Um, and it's not just buckthorn. So looking at this list, the top 10 trees that represent all the trees in the seven county region, we're also seeing honeysuckle and mulberry and European alder. Can I ask you a quick question there, Melissa? Sorry, sure. no, but on the previous slide. So <clears throat> are you saying that 36% of our region's canopy cover is buckthorn? Like that's uh, the third most sure. predominant tree type? That's actually, uh, thank you for asking that question because there is a distinction. It does, it's not 
36% of all the canopy cover is 36 was about all the trees. So if you're counting trunk, wow. and yes. 36% of those. That's so still significant. Wow. Okay. It is. And I don't remember the exact number, but it does rank pretty high in canopy cover too. It's still something like 27% of all the canopy cover. Yes. Wow. We have a big problem. Wow. Okay. Thank you. That's. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, we were able to break this down by county as well. I know, I believe you're all in DuPage County. It's possible somebody joined from a different area. Um, but you can see that buckthorn is not evenly distributed across the region, but that it is a pretty major problem in just about all counties. Kendall County, nice job. Although you've got quite a lot more honeysuckle than the rest. So um, we've all got big challenges with invasive species. And part of that is because a lot of it exists on private property. So here tonight, we're trying to inspire you and um, ho hopefully get you just excited about getting the invasive species out of your yard, because it doesn't matter how much time the park districts and the forest reserves spend clearing those areas, if it's still in backyards, it's going to continue to spread um, back into those natural areas. <clears throat> and I mentioned it's not just buckthorn and honeysuckle. This is hard to read, and I apologize for that, but I'll share the presentation afterwards. So if you'd like to look at a more fine tuned um if you'd like to look more closely afterwards feel free but basically this is a list of different invasive woody plants um, and this is in each of the counties and then chicago called out separately how much of their uh how many how, what percentage of their trees is made up by that species so um you can see buckthorn shows up in every county but also we have problems with things like tree of heaven and uh, Amur honeysuckle, um, black locust. And again, the forest preserves and the park districts spend a lot of money trying to get rid of these things. And in fact, um, this one is showing not just that it's present in each county, um, but what the percentage of changes over the region. So where you have this lighter green color, the more yellowy green, not the bluish green, um, that's where there was an increase from 2010 in that particular invasive species. So we have a lot more Russian olive across the region. We have a lot more, a lot more privet across the region. Um, a shockingly <laughs> increased number of honeysuckle. Um, calorie pear, which is not actually listed yet um, on the state on the state's invasive species list, but it is considered invasive by just about everybody who is paying attention to it. And even the nurseries have slowed down their production because although people still are looking for it, they are aware that it's very likely to become listed as invasive soon. Okay, so that's enough of those stats and details. What is this buckthorn? Why do we care about it? Well, when we say buckthorn, we're really talking about two different species. Sometimes there's a third one, but these are the two main ones. Um, common buckthorn, glossy buckthorn, they're very similar in just about all the characteristics I'm about to mention. So for the purposes of tonight, I'm just gonna call them both buckthorn and keep it in a bucket. In both cases, they're an understory shrub or a small tree. It can get up to 25 feet tall, kind of a loose spreading crown. It can be turned into a hedge. Um, it's dioecious, which is important. That means uh, di is two, eecious is houses. It's two houses. So there's a male plant and a female plant and they are separate. And that's important later in this presentation. Um, how to know if it's in your yard. It's got this kind of egg-shaped leaf that has a point on the tip. Um, it can get kind of glossy. It's a nice dark green usually, unfortunately, nice healthy leaves. Um, you can see that it's got fine teeth around the edges, uh, about three to five veins. This is an interesting characteristic that I find very useful. If you've ever learned about branch attachment on trees to try to identify them, you know that sometimes, let's see, where's my camera? If this is the stem, if you have leaves that are, there's one here, then one here, then one here, and sort of stagger, we call that alternate. But if the leaves come out right opposite of each other, like this, we call that opposite. With buckthorn, it's sub-opposite. So you can see here, where's my mouse? This here is not exactly opposite. There's a node here, and then slightly lower, there's this one. Same thing, there's a node here, and then slightly lower, it's this one. So they're very close to opposite each other, but not quite. It is called buckthorn. And so um, this little protrusion at the end is the reason. It's not technically a thorn, but it is very sharp and pointy and could hurt you if you're walking through a thicket of buckthorn. 
Other things to note, the young bark and the mature bark, they look pretty different. I'll show pictures in a second. Um, so it may not be the, the most useful characteristic to be looking for, but if you're able to peel back some of that bark to verify what you've got, you'll see that the sapwood is yellow and the orange, sorry, and the heartwood, which is a little bit deeper, is um, orange. So here's the bark side by side. You can see it's smooth, almost shiny with lenticels when it's young, and then it gets more peely as it gets older. And here you can see <clears throat> somebody peeled back the bark on this one, and it's got that yellow and the bright orange inside. So if you peel back some bark and you see this, it's almost certainly uh, buckler. The flowers are nothing special. They're kind of a greenish yellowish color. But if you're trying to figure out, you know, if it's May and you're curious, it'll look like that. Um, the berries are more of a giveaway because they stick around for a while. They're dark, purpley, bluish, black, um, and you'll see them between August and September. So this is a good time. If you think you've got in your yard, <clears throat> go back and look for those berries. <coughs> All right, moving on to Amur Honeysuckle. This one is unfortunately pretty. Um, I will give it that, but it's also awful, just awful. Um, it's got opposite leaves. So I mentioned, you know, you've got the stem and the leaves come out directly opposite of each other. That's how it is on this one. And you can see that right where the leaf, where the stem hits the branch, that's where you get um, the flowers. And because that's where you get the flowers, see they're in pairs, that's also where you get the berries. So right along the stem. Um, the stems appear to be hollow. There is actually some tissue in there, but very often if you snap one of the branches, it looks hollow inside. So that's one of the giveaways for honeysuckle. One of the reasons it is such a problem is that it is prolific at producing these bright red berries and those berries get everywhere. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is where I just go on and on about how terrible they are. What's the big deal? Why do we care about buckthorn and honeysuckle? One of the reasons they're bad, besides both producing actually copious amounts of berries that get everywhere and spread, is that they also both leaf out early in the spring and then stay green later in the fall. So first of all, they have a longer photosynthetic period where they're absorbing that sunlight and turning it into carbohydrates that the plant can use um, and store. But that also means that it's going to block out those spring ephemerals <clears throat> and basically shade out anything that could have been growing on the floor of these woodland areas. Because of that, anywhere where we have buckthorn and honeysuckle, you have reduced native cover and diversity. So you have fewer different kinds of plants growing on the floors of these woodlands and a lot less of the ones that are there. This is true of buckthorn, not of honeysuckle. It produces a chemical called emodin, which is found in all parts of the plant, in the berries and the twigs and the roots. Um, most likely the reason it exists in the plants in buckthorn is to deter herbivory, but it has a whole lot of impacts outside of that. So um, first of all, because it's found in all parts of the plant, when the plant tissue decomposes, so sticks that are on the ground, things like that, if the berries are dropping, it's releasing emodin um, into the groundwater, which then goes into all the water streams around you. And it's been found to mutate the embryos of the amphibians that lay their eggs in those waterways. So we're actually seeing major problems in, in the herps, in the amphibians, um, related to areas that have lots of buckthorn. <clears throat> um, the leaf litter from buckthorn also has a higher nitrogen content, um, which you don't need to know that kind of nitty gritty, except to me that it means that it decomposes really fast. And with a fast decomposition means that there isn't a steadily building layer of soil on the ground. A lot of it is eroding off. A lot of it is because the roots aren't there to hold it in. So we have erosion problems. We have um, problems with low amounts of leaf litter building up to be able to slowly decompose over time to maintain that soil level. But it also alters <clears throat> the arthropod communities that are living in the soil. So we're seeing, I talk about wildlife impacts, um, I already mentioned that the amphibians are being harmed, but now the bugs, the critters living in the soil are also being impacted because that's their food source, having the decomposing leaf litter. And beyond that, the high nitrogen level means it's also altering the pH of the soil. So the organisms that could find food don't have the conditions they need to survive. 
<clears throat> and um, there's actually an interesting correlation between earthworms and buckthorn that speeds up the process even more. Okay, um, let's just talk more about how it's terrible for wildlife, birds. So over here, this, these colorful lines, these are the different important flyways that cross um, North America. And you can see here that we're part of two important flyways here. Um, so there are a lot of migrating birds that depend on the food resources, the trees that we have in our region. Well, you may see a lot of birds in your buckthorn hedge if you have one or in your neighbor's buckthorn hedge perhaps. So you may be thinking, well, you know, it's invasive, but at least it's providing food. The problem is the fruits are very low in fat, which um, the migrating birds really rely on. Um, and it causes other problems that are also, if you have a lot of buckthorn, you don't have a lot of the plants that are supporting the insects that the birds would rely on for food sources, especially for feeding their young. Beyond that, the berries are not just low in nutritional value, but that emotive that I mentioned is also a diuretic. So it causes all kinds of uh, diarrhea and digestive problems in these birds. Um, and beyond that, in areas where you have like big honeysuckle patches, uh, there was a study done that birds that nested in these in, in these invasive woody um, brambly areas had a higher level of predation. <laughs> so the birds just can't win in these situations. They're either getting eaten by predators, having trouble flying because they don't have the nutrition or don't have the insects to feed their young. These shrubs are problems. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you are just fired up and enthused and you're about to march over to your neighbor's yard and just start demanding that they take it out and offering to help kindly. Um, so how do you do it though, right? Well, there's a lot of ways. If it's somewhat smaller, there's this tool you can use. <clears throat> Excuse me, <that's> <coughs> Okay. There are tools out there so that you can kind of grip it with this and then use physics <laughs> to lever it out of the ground. If it's small enough or if you only have a couple, this might be a good way to do it because you want to get that whole sucker out of there. But in many cases, it's just not practical. Maybe you have too much buckthorn, too much honeysuckle, um, or you know, maybe it's too big, something like that. So one of the more common ways to deal with buckthorn and honeysuckle is just to cut it, but you can't cut it and leave it. You have to use herbicide. And I know that that's a hard thing to swallow for some people. So I will just say that there is a time and a place to use herbicides. And in this case, when leaving buckthorn to live is much worse, than um, some of the side effects of using something like Roundup in the way it is described in the label. So following the instructions is a good way to limit um, any of the problems that you've heard associated with Roundup. <clears throat> but anyway, that could be a whole presentation in its own <clears throat> and I will not go there. But for tonight, just know that if you cut buckthorn, if that is your strategy, you have to use herbicide. And the good news is you just need it to get in the vascular vascular tissue. So those are the xylem and phloem, the thing that moves the water up and the carbohydrates down, and it all exists just under the bark. So for these small twigs, go ahead and paint the whole stem. There's no point in trying to get just the edges. That would take much longer. But on these really big stumps, you just need to paint the edge. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, if you don't use herbicide, it's just going to continue coming back and becoming a problem. You will never be rid of it. Right. It is also possible to use a foliar herbicide, um, but just make sure that you're following the instructions on the label and that you're doing your research to know what time of year to do it so that you're not harming the other plants with leaves around it. This is one of those things where it's helpful that buckthorn and honeysuckle leaf out early and stay green later. All right, so let's, if we're thinking about your yard and maybe you just have such a large hedge and you don't have the time or the money or whatever resources to get rid of all of it in one shot. I mentioned before that buckthorn is dioecious. That means two houses, male and female. So there's separate male plants and female plants. <clears throat> if you can at least get rid of the ladies first, um, just go out this time of year, see which ones have berries on them and just try to cut those back first. And if you can focus on removing those, then you can take your time removing the males. Yes, they're still releasing, releasing emodin, but at least they're not going to be spreading the berries and leading to um, that kind of spread of the problem. 
Um, if you are allowed to and make sure you're getting the appropriate permits and alerting the fire department as um, required and as good and proper. Um, burning your natural areas if you have a large property can be a way to control invasive species. Again, if you are not um, burn certified, forgetting the right words, somebody put in the chat, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Either take some of the classes which are available um, or make sure that you're working with people who are. Hire contractors who have done this before. <clears throat> and one of the nice things is that you could be flagging the buckthorn in your yard now, flagging the honeysuckle, and then doing it in winter. It's a great time to do this kind of work. You don't have to worry about compacting the soil or accidentally spraying or cutting um, other plants in your yard that you care about, that you've been nurturing. Um, and it's a pretty good workout, so it'll warm you up while you're out there. Plus then you're ended up with this big pile of wood and you can have a bonfire. <clears throat> okay, so these are methods for getting rid of bunny, bunny suckle, uh, buckthorn and honeysuckle. But you, you should go into this knowing that it's not going to be over in one year. No matter how diligent you are, no matter how thoroughly you cleared it, the seeds will stay in the soil for several years. Um, the roots will try to regenerate. It's going to keep coming back. But know that if you take care of it, you put energy and time into it every year, eventually the problem um, will become <laughs> uh, improved. Eventually the buckthorn will go away. Eventually you'll have a restored area. And that's especially true because if you got rid of it and then you plan to put something else in its place, you're nurturing and encouraging a healthy ecosystem. And that's gonna make it harder for these invasives to come back through. Which leads me to the next section, which is tree and shrub replacements. <clears throat> so how do we select trees and shrubs to go into our yards? <coughs> um, I always like to include this bit here and again, it's kind of a tricky visual, but just know that these are two different communities, community one, community two, and in both communities, they have four tree species, tree A, tree B, tree C, tree D. These are the four species. This picture on top, community one, has an even mix of all four species. So there's 25% of species A, 25% species B, 25% species C, and 25% species D. In community two, <clears throat> they have the same four species, but it's almost all species A. Um, for this example, let's just refer to species A as maples, right? <laughs> and I use that example because in our region, we have so many maples. And guess what? We had, um, we had a lot of ash, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in 2010, when we did the tree census, 13 million of the trees in the seven county region were ash. And then the emerald ash borer came through and wiped them out. Um, and so when you have this kind of a mix of diversity, this low diversity, and it means that species A is vulnerable to any pest that comes through and will wipe out most of your trees. So when you're thinking about what to plant in your yard, I hope part of what you're thinking is also, do all of my neighbors have a red bud? Maybe I shouldn't plant a red bud. Do all of my neighbors have um, a sugar maple, maybe I shouldn't plant a sugar maple. So trying to diversify your neighborhood by considering what's around you is really important for making your entire community more resilient. <coughs> and here's a, a picture version of what I just said. This is why species diversity is important. This is a, tr a street lined with ash trees and this is just a couple years later. You can see this is still summer because there's one leafy tree back here. Um, let's just do that to break our hearts. Oh, wrong way. Break our hearts one more time. Nice tree lined street. And here it is a street full of dead trees because they were all the same type of tree. <clears throat> it also helps to diversify the things you're planting in your yard because it'll make the what we call the urban forest. It's all the trees and shrubs and all of it to put together across the region. And it makes the whole thing more resilient to all the extreme weather we're seeing with climate change. So there's been an increase in the frequency and severity of storms. And sometimes the storm, sometimes we'll see you know, a nice mild winter, warmer temperatures than average, but then it's still punctuated by ice storms. And sometimes we'll have a summer or sorry, a year where the spring starts out droughty and then the summer is very wet and you need a variety of trees that can handle all these conditions. It's not as simple as finding trees that are just south of our growing region and planting them up here because they may not be tolerant of ice storms and they may not be tolerant of flooding. 
variety is what's going to help us out here, having a good diversity in our trees and shrubs. <clears throat> and again, not to mention all those pests and diseases around the corner that really focus on just one specific genus. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so enough of, you know, the general planting uh, diverse stuff conversation. How do you pick the diverse plants that you're using? Um, well, consider your site. You know, before picking up, don't just go to a nursery and say, this is beautiful, I want this. Think about what will grow well in your spot. So growing conditions, that's how much light, how moist is the soil? Is it exposed to salt from a busy road? Um, location, do you wanna use it as a windbreak to, to reduce your heating costs in winter? <clears throat> do you have utility lines to worry about? So other things like that. And then of course, also think about what you want. Do you want to have native trees and attract wildlife to your yard? I would encourage that. Um, think about things like structure and form. So <clears throat> this is a picture of calorie pear, which I already mentioned is invasive. <clears throat> um, but besides being invasive and smelling terrible in spring, it's also just got terrible form. So the, the limbs are very upright like this and that they have really weak attachment. So all it takes is a strong gust of wind and those branches fall down. So, you know, for all the other reasons, it's not good to plant a calorie pear. It's also not good to plant a calorie pear next to a playground if you're going to do it because those branches might be likely to fall, right? So thinking about things like structure, don't plant trees that are known to be um, a little more fragile and strong wind in places where there's valuable stuff underneath them. <clears throat> and of course, another thing to consider, um, edible parts. Maybe you want to plant native, but you also want to be able to harvest some food for yourself. Well, first of all, good luck, because a lot of the native edibles attract the wildlife that takes them first. But it could be a fun race to get those service berries first, or the pawpaws, or the hazelnuts, or the elderberry. There's so much good stuff out there. You can definitely pick edible plants that are also native. All right, um, and I apologize, I forgot to take this slide out. We just got a new website at the Arboretum and this tool is no longer up. We are figuring out how to find it and put it back up. But at the moment, um, if you're curious, we do have the book version of this, Selecting and Planting Trees, which just looks at the growing conditions required by more than 200 trees that can grow well in Northern Illinois. Um, so I believe if you go to this link, you may still be able to find the place to request um, this booklet. Otherwise you can ask the plant clinic. Um, and if you find a tree or shrub you like, um, you can buy it locally. If you go to gardenillinois.com um, and just enter the species you're looking at, they can tell you which garden centers around you carry it or which nurseries around you carry it. Um, you can also get it from the local plant sales that your community is hosting. And I think you might hear more about that at the end of this talk. <clears throat> um, but here are some examples of other garden sales and plant sales. If you go to illinoisplants.org, it also shares the native plant sales. All right, and of course, this talk is called Healthy Hedges, and that is because we have a brochure series that includes healthy hedges, healthy homes, and healthy habitats. These are all focused on um, encouraging landowners and land managers to make good swaps in their property to get rid of those invasives that are causing major problems across the region and to replace them Mostly with natives, but I will tell you some of our brochure pieces, brochure pieces do cover non-natives that are not problems for those who just uh, are not willing to plant only native. But so here's lots of suggestions on this page. And again, I'll share this PowerPoint so you can look at this more closely, or you can go to the website, chicagorti.org slash healthy brochure series to, to print it out, to save some, uh, spend some time looking through it. <clears throat> The species on this page are specifically species that can be grown in a hedge. So, you know, planted just a few feet apart in a line and sometimes even um, pruned to have nice flat edges to be more of a traditional hedge. Healthy homes, this is what Lydia was talking about last time. So there's more to having a healthy yard than just getting rid of your invasive species. Um, and hopefully you can take advantage of some of these tips. If you have a very large property, some of these tips will help you just figure out your management practices for the larger landscape. But again, a big piece of that is still getting rid of your invasive species and planting things that will encourage a healthy ecosystem. 
this is that same brochure um, with the other side. And I am quickly running out of time. So I'm just going to go through these plants very quickly. Here are some trees that are not planted a ton of in the region, um, but are still at least marginally or regionally native. Hey, and Melissa, you have yeah. about 10 more minutes. So I go do. ahead. Okay. Yeah, for thank sure. you, thank you. <laughs> We'd love right. to hear about these actually. <laughs> so, <take laughs> um, so this one is the cucumber magnolia. <clears throat> um, you can see it's got just this really cool, funky, hot pink fruit. It's a really tall magnolia. So if you're looking for a big tree, this one could get up to 80 feet tall. Um, and I apologize, this one is not native specifically to the Chicago region. It's sort of to the region, uh, the larger region. Um, persimmon is another good one. This one, there's no pictures of it here, unfortunately, but it's got a really cool bark. Um, so it's got some good winter interest that way. And it is a fruit that is edible if you get it at just the right time, but you have to fight off the raccoons because they also know how good it is. This one can still be a fairly big tree getting up to 60 feet tall, um, but it's a more narrower tree. <clears throat> Sassafras works if you're looking for a smaller footprint. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this one only gets to be about 30 feet tall and it's just got this beautiful fall color that you can see up here and the leaves smell wonderful. So, um, you know, if you've got a smaller space, this could be the one for you. Just all of these slides I'm showing you have too much detail for a presentation, but go ahead and go back and look at it to see things like um, it prefers acidic soils. So, you know, that's the kind of thing to notice. You might want to test the pH of your soil ahead of time. And before buying it and committing to a tree, just making sure that this is going to be happy in your site. All right, these next couple slides are focused more on the shrubby side of things, although there are some small trees. And it comes from Chris Benda, who perhaps you've seen presentations from, um, if not, I encourage him, he's a great speaker. Um, anyway, he came up with these suggestions for what to replace your invasives with. So for example, if you have calorie pear, which I've mentioned a few times, um, it's invasive, it has bad form, it smells terrible in spring, it's not a great tree, but it has pretty spring colors and has pretty fall color. Sorry, pretty spring flowers, pretty fall color. So a lot of people like it, um, but if you want those pretty spring flowers, there are other choices. Um, we have some hawthorn, some dogwood, some American plum. I mean, look at these are gorgeous, right? You don't need to have the calorie pear and get that terrible smell with it. Burning bush. Uh, I'm certain that very soon we'll all be seeing burning bush in front of houses just because it's so vibrant. And I will say that is, it's like a shocking, gorgeous color, right? But look at this hazelnut. That's beautiful. It sells a really a vibrant fall color. So you can still plant that in front of your house um, and potentially get the hazelnuts off of it to eat. Although once again, the wildlife will probably get there first. Maybe make a nice hedge of it. You can get a few. Um, if, you're, if you have maybe a taller hedge of lilacs or Japanese tree, tree lilacs have gotten more popular. Lilacs are not invasive, but they're not native either. They're, they don't provide a whole lot of services to the wildlife. Um, Japanese tree lilac is one that some people are concerned about. It is also not officially on any invasive species lists in the state of Illinois, um, but there have been some concerns about how aggressively it spreads. So just that is my note on that side. So if you already have a lilac hedge, maybe you're thinking it's time to replace it. There are other ways to go. Um, so you can plant spice bush, Lindera benzoin, or um, Viburnum lentago. I think that's black haw. I'm blinking for a second here, my apologies. Um, but again, they get these nice taller forms. They're kind of taller shrubs, but they still have pretty berries or um, nice fall, nice, nice flowers, just like these lilacs. So they're still pretty good for creating that nice head look. Boxwood, um, it's one of those lower shrubs that people use more just to create an edge on something rather than to create privacy. Um, another one that I think smells kind of bad, might just be a personal preference, don't know. Um, you can plant black currants. It can do the same thing. Now this one is deciduous, so it won't have that cover in in winter, um, <clears throat> but you will still see the branches will still create an edge to something. It's not the boxwood was ever creating like a big privacy screen to begin with. Okay, 
I flew past those. I do want to make sure to talk about how to take care of these new trees and shrubs once they're in the ground. Um, starting with how to get it into the ground. And uh, forgive me if Lydia already covered all this, but um, it's really important to make sure you're planting your tree right. You can spend $300 on a tree. And if you just dig a quick hole and throw it in there, it might not live more than a couple of years. And that's a big invest, sorry, big investment lost. So spend the time to make sure that you've got a $3,000 hole to go with your $300 tree. Um, and that means dig the hole two to three times as wide as this root ball that it's coming in. Um, make sure when you're planting it, that you kind of dig out the top to make sure that you're seeing where this tree flares into the root. When it's in the ground, you want this flare to be visible above the ground. Um, and then don't forget the mulch. So there are a lot of thoughts on mulch these days. Ultimately, mulch is so much better than turf grass for a lot of reasons, but mulch is also just important for supporting the microorganisms in your soil, reducing the pH in your soil because it increases um, the number of organisms that are in there in your soil, eating the decomposing wood and then releasing their waste, which acidifies the soil enough that it makes it um, better for more plants. Um, the mulch helps retain more soil, sorry, moisture in the soil. So it's kind of insulating from evapor evaporation. Um, it maintains temperature regulation. So roots don't go dormant in the winter. Above ground tissue does, below ground tissue does not. So it's helping create that insulating blanket also for temperature regulation. So mulch is good as long as you're doing it right. These are examples of doing it wrong. Please do not mound the mulch up your tree. You are supposed to be mulching the soil, not the tree. Um, all those benefits I mentioned about how it is improving the number of microorganisms in your soil and the pH and the holding moisture in, those are all things you want happening in the soil. You don't want to hold microorganisms and moisture into the bark, right? That'll just create um, opportunities for rotting wood at the base of your tree, but trees take a long time to die. So if you're holding moisture to the bottom of your trunk and it's slowly rotting, it's still gonna get bigger. And now you've got a big heavy tree with a rotten base and that is a terrible idea. Um, besides that, the roots, roots do not think, right? They are following the direction of the easiest direction to grow where there is moisture and nutrients. They are just moving towards all those things that are good environments. If you have a big pile of mulch right above them and you have really hard clay filled soil, they're not going to want to dig through the soil. They're going to move up and go just around the mulch. So A, they're not spreading out wide like you want tree roots to do, but now they're also circling around the tree. And as the tree gets bigger, it's basically constricting the growth of these trees. We call that girdling roots. So you can see here, this young tree, if you uncover this in your yard, <clears throat> you could still with, take some pruners, cut out some of these circling roots, straighten them out and try to fix this problem. As long as you're not cutting every single root because that tree will obviously fall over. But when you have a situation like this, you have to call in a professional and they may tell you that you have to cut down the tree. At this point, cutting these roots could weaken the tree, cause it to die anyway. Or you could find out that there's no roots going out to hold the tree up and it was always a risk of falling over onto cars or something like that. So if you pull back your mulch tonight, right after this conversation, because you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't know I've been doing it wrong all these years or my landscaper did it, I thought it was right. Pull back that mulch. And if you see something like this, you're gonna need to hire a certified arborist to come in and just get their input on how to fix it or if it's fixable. Here's a reminder about how to spread mulch two to three inches deep, not touching the trunk, um, but also watering. So I know big trees look like they don't need water. Um, and you'll hear that from a lot of people, you don't have to water your trees, but if it's been droughty and hot for six weeks, you should bring a couple bucket loads over to your big trees even. And for trees that you're just planting, you're gonna wanna water them um, probably once a week for the first three growing seasons. Those first three years if you plant a tree really sort of set the foundation for how well your tree's gonna do and how likely it is to make it to maturity. And once it's planted, once it gets past the establishment phase of those first three years, keep checking on it. You know, periodically water it, look at it. Um, I don't have time to go over this whole diagram, but do know that you should be looking for anything that is stressing your tree out because stressed trees get more diseases and have shorter lifespans. 
This is a great guide if you're curious about invasive pests and plants. Um, if you're interested in getting your yard recognized and getting a cool sticker for your front window um, to show off that you've gotten rid of your invasives, again, reach out to me. Um, if you want to tell your neighbors about how to water and mulch their trees property with the help of all these logos from people who know about trees, um, we can get out these door hangers for you and you can share them with your contact information around your neighborhood. I encourage you to run some kind of stewardship events in your community to get rid of buckthorn and honeysuckle, make it a comp competition, get high school students to take out invasives on their own property and have a battle with brush pile. We will be working for ideas for trying to inspire people next year. Um, and so if you have ideas for how to just get people revved up about this, um, again, reach out to me or let me know what ideas you've got and we can see if we can support you in some way. Here's another one. There's another group that does the Buckthorn Fine Art Festival. Get some wood turners out there to do stuff with wood buckthorn and have a chili cook off and cut buckthorn and have a great day. Okay, apologize for the speed talking. Get a little bit excited about this, this topic and had a lot to say about it. Um, I welcome your questions. Thank you, Melissa. So we had a couple in the chat and Renee did a great job of answering them, but I'm gonna read them out just in case you have something to add or Christy has something to add. Um, so Maggie said, I removed 50 buck buckthorn trees from my yard in May 2020. Mm -hmm. After applying Roundup, I wrapped each stump in plastic. This year I dug up all the stumps, but the soil is still gnarled with roots. What can I do to improve the soil quality? That is a tricky question. Um, I'm glad Renee answered that. You know, I would guess that there are just good tools for trying to pull those roots out, but um, yeah, if we have time, do you mind if Renee just answers it out loud or I can pull this, I can pull the chat now. Yeah, I don't have a better answer. Yeah, I'm not sure if Renee, oh, here she is. Okay. Sorry oh, about yes. that. Yeah, I don't know, it's really tricky. I mean, especially around here when we have um, a lot of clay soil too, those roots are kind of up high and you trip over them. And I mean, the only thing you can really do is build that soil up and, you know, it, I don't know the scale that you're talking about, but with 50 trees, I'm guessing a pretty decent area. I just would keep piling leaves and leaves and leaves and let them decompose. And hopefully you don't have a ton of earthworms <laughs> decomposing it really fast. Um, but um, yeah, patience, unfortunately, is, is the thing. You just gotta wait for them to decompose and then add, add leaves or straw or you know, stems that you cut back, like any kind of organic matter, I would just keep piling it on in there and, and hopefully that'll help build your soil up. But it takes a long time to build soil. Thank you. And then Patty asked, how soon after removing the buckthorn can you plant a new tree in that spot? Yeah, so that one, <laughs> I've, I've heard a few different versions of this. Some people will just put down a ton of mulch over that area and like wait for the next growing season. But because the Demodin does sometimes have like an allelopathic effect, you may have trouble getting anything to grow. Um, so I guess it depends on how much money and time you're willing to throw at it. Um, if you can get something to grow, it'll be faster to recover, but you may have trouble getting anything to grow. Yeah, and my comment on that one real quick too, and I'm, I'm doing this, like I'm, we're cutting out hundreds and hundreds at a time. And so, the soil is really shot by the time you clear those trees out of there. Um, <clears throat> and we are applying to a lot of chemicals, unfortunately. I mean, we're doing it very meticulously, but there is a half-life associated with the chemicals because we use a systemic one that pulls it down into the root structure. And I've like cleared and like Roundup really is a quick, a quicker um, half-life than like some of the chemicals that I use. Um, but I planted too soon afterwards. And um, the trees have not been crazy healthy. And then we're also dealing with the aftermath of lots of baby buckthorns that are coming up now that they've got sun. And if you, if you had female trees in the area, um, and then again, that the chemicals from the, the buckthorn itself are probably present. And so you may wanna just hold out a little bit and just let some of those things settle down before you try to plant again, or at least not invest in a tree that's really expensive. Maybe buy something small and little give it a shot and then it's not like a waste of your time and investment putting it in if it doesn't thrive. Thank you. So we've still got a few minutes. If anyone else has a question, now is the time to put that in the chat. Um, in the meantime, would you like to tell us about the plant sale that's coming up? 
Yeah, we would love to. Thank you. And it's a big uh, thank you to Renee, who has uh, facilitated this with the Conservation Foundation. And Renee, what is this our third or fourth year in Glen Ellen? This will be year four. Four. And it was really exciting. I'm between year and two and year three, I think orders more than doubled um, for this sale. And again, it's not a profit sale for Glen Ellen or for the park district. It's just a community service to make these resources available. And sometimes, um, you know, the native plants or the, these, you know, selected ones good for the region are difficult to find. So the Conservation Foundation has been a great partner in that and making those available. So today is Wednesday, and I believe it is all the way through next Wednesday that you can place orders. Um, and right now it's being promoted right on the Park District website. So if you go to gepark.org, uh, one of the little slider uh, promotions, you'll see it right there. It'll take you right to the site uh, to order. Are there any, um, any, uh, any favorites that you've seen this year, Renee, or anything you'd like to promote? Um, no, I haven't. Uh, <clears throat> we, the Conservation Foundation helped facilitate this. And so Jan's wonderful over there and she um, has been keeping track of it. So um, <laughs> I know we've gotten several orders in, but I don't know what's, what the top runners are. But yeah, you have until next Wednesday, the 15th to put orders in until 5 p.m. But then it, it, the sale does cut off so that they can get everything processed and work with the nursery. And then the pickup is on Saturday, September 25th. And these plants are, I believe all of them are $30 each. Um, they're in a five gallon size container. Um, and so it's, you can easily get them in a car, get them home. The hole you're not digging is, is crazy big. And so it's an easy way to um, try a couple natives out without a, a huge cost investment or time investment, getting them in the ground and see what happens. I wanted to share something from uh, Doug Tallamy's book and whether it's buying from this sale or just, you know, as you're planning for the yard, it was interesting that he was making the case instead of planting like one tree or one shrub, start to consider a grove or, you know, a, a hedge as kind of as Melissa's been talking about, because the roots, you know, will support each other in the ground and, you know, in terms of strong winds and things like that, they will actually start to become their own little ecosystem and thinking even of, of about, um, you know, taller trees, medium sized trees, and then shrubs kind of stacked against each other, right? So I don't know, Melissa, do you wanna expand on that a little bit? Or you're, I see you're nodding your head, so I don't know if maybe you disagree. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, basically, if you're looking at like a forest, it has different layers to it. So mm -hmm. as much as you can try to recreate what naturally occurs in your own property, you're gonna see that everything's healthier altogether. Um, you know, those understory plants need more shade. So if you plant something taller above them, you're naturally creating that shade. Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, other so it's kind of like choosing for the site, choosing the, you know, really paying attention to the height of what you're planting. And um, I think even one of your slides, I enjoyed that it showed choosing the right site in, in relation to your house, right? So is it providing, you know, protection from the south or from the east east winds and things like that, that it'll reduce your energy costs over time? Um, anyway, yeah, there's just some good strategies there, right, in terms of location. Uh, and then also, I guess one last thing that, I, and again, you alluded to this is we're talking, so in some cases, we're Tonight we're talking about um, putting in new, you know, removing invasives and putting in new um, hedges or trees, but it's also just as important to preserve the ones we already have. And so one of the key things we can do there that um, Melissa touched on, if you have existing trees, making sure we're removing the grass, you know, the, the um, lawn grass um, into like a healthy boundary around them <laughs> so that we can, uh, and then mulching it can make a big difference in terms of improving not only health of the trees, but also creating habitat for um, all of the things that thrive and live on the trees that we have. If I have 10 seconds just to add, um, yeah, yeah, it goes back it. to the layers and creating an ecosystem oh, yeah. and habitat. Um, there's a growing movement for not just wood mulch, but what we call a growing mulch, sorry, a living mulch. Okay. So that's where you can put your perennials, add your sedges, add your ferns, whatever it is around the base of a tree. Don't put annuals in that you've got to dig every year and have to damage the roots, but um, you know, certainly get rid of the turf, but you can still have plants underneath your trees and that will improve the health of the tree as well. Terrific. That, yeah, that's really good advice. The perennials.
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Renee. Um, I really appreciate your investment today. Um, we've learned so much and it is it was very inspiring. Uh, like I learned so much more about Buckthorn and um, why not to have it. <laughs> so I'm eager to get out there and get some out of our side yard. I know there's some there. <laughs> but and thank you also, Brenna, again, to the uh, Glen Ellen Public Library. We really appreciate your sponsorship and support um, in making a talk like this happen. So thank You're you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Have a great evening. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.